confined in a vortex of tension where fear and anger rule. Their greatest enemy is one another. Survival often depends on savagery. America's prisons have produced a new breed of predators. If we let them go without the handcuffs, there'd be blood on the yard all day long. They are attacking each other on sight. Locked cells and thick walls keep them safely isolated from the public. However, each day, many are not behind bars. They're on the nation's roadways and flight paths. Basically, that is a prison. We're moving down the road. These planes are a high max cell block in the sky. We do the same thing at any jail. We just do it 35,000 feet in the air and a lot faster. The officers who transport America's convicts are on constant alert. They know a crisis can erupt at any moment, ignited by dangerous and desperate men lusting for escape. Anything can go wrong when you're outside of the walls. When you think you've seen it all, you haven't seen anything yet. Operating this high-flying powder keg is the Justice Prisoner Alien Transportation System, or JPATS. But to guards and prisoners alike, it is known simply as Con Air. Entrusted with the formidable task of transporting America's convicted felons are the United States Marshals. The nerve center of their operation is the JPATS Command Center outside of Kansas City, Missouri. Here, the travel itineraries of prisoners all across the nation are meticulously scheduled, then closely monitored as the convicts are in transit. Supervising the command center's activities is U.S. Marshal Kent Pekarik. Uh, sometimes we're referred to as a travel agency. Uh, somebody calls a travel agency and says, I want to go from Miami to uh, Atlanta. That's pretty simple. But the people that we're moving aren't making the phone calls. It could be a United States District Judge, it could be a U.S. Magistrate, it could be a defense attorney. And they're calling us and saying, we want uh, John Doe in Miami uh, at this place in Los Angeles by 2 o'clock next Thursday. Although transferring convicts is potentially perilous, it's a necessity. Some must be transferred to maximum security prisons because of a long record of attempted escapes. Others are international felons facing extradition who must be relocated to foreign nations. But the majority of convicts in transit are those legally entitled or obligated to make appearances in America's courts. Transporting the most menacing criminals on the same highways and flight paths as the citizens they have endangered is the price of a free society. On any given day, the Marshal Service has approximately 35,000 prisoners in its custody and these people are in one stage or another of the federal judicial process. They're either on trial, testifying in a trial, or awaiting uh, transportation to a Bureau of Prisons facility to serve their sentence. Before JPATS, or Con Air, was formed, all of these prisoners were moved across the country exclusively on the ground. Now they can be transported by a fleet of three 727s, two DC-9s, and eight corporate-sized jets. The swifter system ensures greater security. It's far better to fly a prisoner across the country in four hours or five hours than to take several days to drive them. The longer they're out of the secure environment, the greater the risk. Even on a flight of short duration, however, the risks can only be minimized, never eliminated. Although the U.S. Marshals rigidly enforce the most extreme security measures, the convicts in their custody are a volatile mix of desperation and resourcefulness. 
They board Conair from Leavenworth, from San Quentin, and from Attica. Men convicted of murder, rape, and acts of terrorism. They range from low-level gangsters and petty thieves to high-profile convicts such as New York mobster John Gotti and Oklahoma City bombers Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols. But no matter what their criminal background, they have one thing in common. Outside the secure walls of a federal penitentiary, even surrounded by vigilant armed guards, they may be tempted by even the remotest possibility of escape. Most of the prisoners uh, in our custody are, are uh, felons, and they uh, have generally uh, been determined to be a flight risk. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in our custody. They'd be out on bail. Any time you move a prisoner outside of a secure environment, like a jail or a prison, you increase the opportunity for escape. The chances of escape grow even higher when a convict in transit is able to receive help from an outside accomplice. In order to prevent this scenario, the marshals devising a prisoner's travel plans operate in conditions of absolute secrecy. We don't tell the prisoners, number one, when they're going to be moved. So if you don't tell them, they can't tell anybody ahead of time. No one outside of JPATS knows the specific route any convict will take to get from point A to point B. Another routine security precaution taken during the planning phase is an exhaustive background check of each traveling prisoner. Because of security issues and medical issues, safety issues, we want to know what type of individual we're moving. In fact, we probably know more about that particular individual than he knows about himself. Armed with detailed biographical information, JPAT's travel coordinators are able to make sure that rival gangs and sworn enemies never share the same Con Air flight. Every effort is made to snuff out any problem long before it has a chance to spark a crisis at 35,000 feet. While America sleeps, the transportation operation begins. The Conair network utilizes not only planes, but a specialized fleet of cars, vans, and buses. Good morning. How are you doing? The pre-dawn start time is designed to minimize risk to the nation's motorists by taking to the roads when traffic is lightest. Here at the Chino State Prison in Southern California, prisoners become part of a process that is repeated every day of the year throughout the country, but goes all but unnoticed by the public. The officers start with a thorough examination of the prison bus. As they confirm its mechanical readiness, the prisoners are prepped for transfer. Gomez! Gomez! In the back of the reception center, they, uh, the officers back there, they're the ones that pull them out of their housing units. Uh, they bring them out and they do a strip search on them. And they place them in holding tanks until we arrive. We transport all level of inmates from drunk driving to multiple murders and everything in between. We transport a total of 38 at any given time on the bus. First two, come on up. When we load the inmates first on the bus, the sergeant would uh, let the inmates know what their expectations are. All you need to worry about is sit there, keep your mouth shut until you get to where you're going. Everybody understand it. We move, I don't know, thousands and thousands of inmates a year, and, and uh, you're always going to have some incidents you're, you're bound to. All right. It's going to get there. You'll get there sometime today again. Once the bus is loaded with passengers, firearms are issued to each of the transportation officers. Yes, we're armed. We have our, our actual uh, weapons on our sides, plus uh, we're armed with other weapons that are on the bus. The precise positions taken by the guards aboard these mobile prisons is a detail they are not willing to share with our cameras. They maintain that such vital information could potentially be used by a prisoner's accomplices waiting in ambush along the vehicle's designated route. Sometimes less information 
is good so that people can't use it against us. We're not going to expose our security procedures. At 5 a.m., the bus leaves the grounds of the Chino State Prison. Despite JPAT's elaborate security precautions, the veteran guards are all too aware that they are now entering an environment that is no longer in their complete control. On the outside, they realize anything can happen. When you think you've seen it all, you haven't seen anything yet, that's basically what they have to look out for, the unexpected. They're watching 12 seconds up the road where most drivers probably aren't doing that. They also are concerned about the possibility of ambush, you know, uh, moving these convicted felons. They're, they're watching for vehicles that would be following, pulling up beside. So it's kind of a counterintelligence, I would guess, for lack of a better term. With no nightmarish scenario impossible, the tension aboard these vehicles is as tangible as the weapons the guards brandish in order to combat it. The intensity is perhaps even more palpable thousands of feet overhead, aboard the Con Air jets. At 35,000 feet, one lapse in security among the world's most dangerous convicts could trigger catastrophe. At 11 a.m. at a small Midwestern airport, an aircraft identified as Justice 113 begins its final approach. Justice uh, 113 is 20 miles fly. Copy, 20 miles. Few observing the nondescript 727 would suspect that its passengers are some of the most violent convicted criminals in America. This is one of thousands of Con Air flights that occur each year. When large numbers of dangerous prisoners must be transported across the country, the most secure method is to segregate them aboard their own plane. The nature of their crimes makes it very difficult to put them on commercial aircraft, even with armed escorts. And so JPATS was designed to be able to move these people long distances in relatively short periods of time in maximum security. We've moved probably a thousand prisoners and detainees a day on JPATS. This is 113 uh, Mars Tower, check wheels down, wind estimated calm, clear two land on way three two. For some of the convicts aboard, this is only a brief layover. For others, it is their final destination. And still more prisoners will board here. The only difference between this flight and that of any conventional airline is that the entire procedure occurs within the most extreme security system imaginable. The moment when the chances of escape seem most tempting, perhaps, is the crucial period of deplaning or boarding. Our very first thought is to not give that prisoner any ideas that there's a possibility to escape. Or there's a possibility to create a diversion of someone else possibly escaping. Disembarking convicts are transferred immediately to the custody of a ground unit of U.S. Marshals. We're down here to pick up nine prisoners off the Marshal Service airlift to take back to Des Moines for court appearances. Before they are boarded into a waiting security van, each prisoner is rigorously searched. We uh, shake them down, we pat them down, make sure they haven't picked up any paraphernalia or anything off the plane that they shouldn't have. The tight security never lapses, as prisoner restraints are rechecked for the next phase of transport. They're all restrained with uh, belly chains, handcuffs, and leg irons at all times, and they're not removed during the trip at all. For the next eight hours, the marshal's van will be their prison on the road. As their journey continues, so does the vigilance of the officers guarding them. When we're in transit with prisoners, we consider them all a maximum security risk. 99% of the time, they, they know what they've done wrong, and you know they don't mess with us, and we don't mess with them. With all arriving prisoners safely dispatched in ground vehicles, Con Air now prepares to board a new slate of convicts. Vehicles are unloaded one at a time, so that no prisoner can avoid close scrutiny in a crowd. Once again, 
This moment of transition between bus and plane is often viewed by the desperate as their best and last opportunity to escape. They psychologically may be thinking that we're outside the bars, now's our chance to do something. We do a very thorough job of searching them at every opportunity to make sure that they don't have a, a key to a handcuff or an implement that they could use to pick the cuffs. Any seemingly innocuous object, like a pencil or paperclip, can become an effective weapon in the hands of a hardened convict. Even in an outwardly docile prisoner who appears to pose no threat. Even though you're concentrating on those people who are considered armed and dangerous, extremely violent, you can't forget the person that, that doesn't show any violence or doesn't have a past history. Because a lot of times, um, if you drop your guard and you're not watching that individual, that's the person that may hurt you or hurt another prisoner or uh, may hurt themselves. In all, 137 potentially explosive prisoners are on this Con Air flight. Justice 113, At 1 p.m., Justice 113 is cleared for takeoff. The final destination is Oklahoma City. Now, all seems calm. But no federal marshal aboard will make the critical mistake of assuming it will remain so for the duration of the journey. 1.30 p.m. Con Air soars at its cruising altitude. U.S. Marshals guarding hardened convicts hope the flight will be uneventful, but are fully prepared for the unexpected. Right now you're on one of the JPAT 727s. We consider this to be a maximum type security institution. Even though we're 31,000 feet above the ground, we have over 100 prisoners on board this airplane right now. Kevin, all your passengers and chains was a little bit strange. All our flight attendants are hairy legged for the most part. <laughs> And nobody complains if the movie is bad or the champagne's stale. And we don't look for smooth air. Every inmate's watched very closely by a roving uh, person on the aircraft will walk up and down the aisle uh, looking at their handcuffs, their restraint devices, and their seat belts to assure security. As much as the marshals may like to restrain their prisoners to their seats to ensure virtually foolproof security, Safety considerations prevent it. They are never physically attached or restrained to the airplane. So if there is an emergency, uh, uh, we'll be able to get those prisoners off the airplane. With prisoner movement disallowed but physically possible, there is always the chance that two convicts could suddenly endanger all aboard by lashing out violently at one another. Imagine this harrowing scenario playing itself out in a cramped aircraft miles above the ground. Even worse, perhaps, could be a staged struggle designed to create a diversion so that an accomplice would have an opportunity to free himself from his restraints. The main concern would be a prisoner getting out of their restraints. Having a prisoner get out of their handcuffs or their leg irons would be the, the worst thing that could happen. As far as the prisoner becoming so unruly that we would lose control of that prisoner, and a prisoner possibly taking over uh, the control of an aircraft, that it's highly unlikely that that would ever happen. But first of all, we, we have an adequate force of personnel on board the airplane. If necessary, marshals aboard Con Air are authorized to use firearms to halt a prisoner's aggression. But only as a last resort, in a pressurized aircraft cabin, any errant bullet which pierces the hull could endanger the lives of everyone. To help avoid this, only highly qualified marshal personnel are authorized to fly on JPAT's aircraft. While the guards aboard Con Air must follow rigid policies about their use of weapons, for the prisoners, the only rule is that there are no rules. The greatest challenge facing JPATs is to prevent their captive passengers from smuggling aboard lethal weapons. It is a problem that begins in America's penitentiaries, where officials confiscate scores of homemade weapons each day. Finding more and more weapons now, uh, we used to find many, many of these metal, what we call bone crusher type weapons, that are uh, big, thick, heavy metal. Um, they've become more effective over the years of 
uh, stopping the amount of metal that they're able to uh, get their hands on now. Uh, this weapon here is made out of a cigarette lighter. Uh, this piece here, uh, which is a very effective piece, it's made out of plexiglass. They can definitely be fatal. This weapon here is another one we would consider a bone crusher. Um, it was fashioned from a, uh, an arm on a door closing device uh, similar to this one right here. It's almost exactly the same as this one right here. In order to conceal such weapons from prison officials or to smuggle them aboard Con Air, resourceful convicts have invented extreme measures. The inmates have become extremely intelligent as far as, uh, or conniving I should say, as far as where they hide the weapons. A lot of them now they're screening them in their uh, rectal cavities. Um, they're, they'll hide them in their shoes. Uh, they'll uh, sew them into their waistbands of their underwear, so they're very hard to detect. One of our inmates, he had a, a wound that was on his leg, and he actually slide a flat metal weapon like that down into it and hide it inside of his leg. To prevent such lethal devices from being smuggled aboard a Con Air flight, federal marshals make the first of many searches of their captive prisoners long before they arrive at the airport. Uh, if the individual is going on the airlift, we make sure that we strip him out and check every part of his body to make sure that he has nothing on him whatsoever. We do a complete search of the uh, subjects before we uh, transport them. We check their hair, make sure there's nothing in it. Uh, we check their mouth, of course, for all for contraband. We start from one area and then we move to the next area and that's because you don't want to miss nothing. So you're breaking it up in different quadrants so that you wouldn't miss anything. Again, I'll check the backside again, check the waistband. We pull all the pockets out and make sure there's nothing in there. We put on his uh, full restraints on him, which uh, includes handcuffs, waist chains, and leg irons. And we'll put on a what we call a black box. You'll see that the black box is covering up the keyholes of the handcuffs. If he was to have some contraband on him, he cannot reach to those keyholes and open up these handcuffs. Tony here is going to put on the leg irons on the subject, so the subject cannot run. And each of these, the handcuffs and the leg irons both have double locks on them. Marshals make sure to know which of their prisoners face a date with a gas chamber or a lethal injection. They may be the most unpredictable and dangerous captives of all. The biggest risk offenders, I suppose, that you would say we have are probably the people that are facing a death sentence. Those folks are bad actors, there's no question about it, and you need to have them controlled at all times because they don't have a whole lot to lose. The entry and exit point to the courthouse is a double-doored chamber called a sally port. Only one door can be opened at a time. Steel and concrete barricades prevent any forced entry. This area will only be vulnerable when these barricades are lowered and the garage door is open. Before this happens, Weapons are drawn. We can have armed officers outside making sure that no one attempts to uh, interfere with that motorcade. Uh, when we open up this bay door here, we are in the middle of the public. Uh, a lot of cars going by, so we've got to make sure, for safety reasons, we've got to make sure we have a weapon and hand. We never know what could happen. makes its way to the airport. Across the country, a different breed of prisoners are readied for Justice 113's next stop. Okay, inmate Smith, I need you to step out of your cell, please. Walk down the hallway here. Female prisoners are moved with the same painstaking precaution as the men. Uh, I need you to grab over the uh, top of that chair and lean up on it. Your left arm down. Basically, it's maintaining security at all times. They're never just a passenger. They are secured inside the prison as they are outside the prison. A Con Air passenger cabin is one of the rare venues in which males and females share the same maximum security facility. By 4 p.m., Con Air is once again at full capacity at its cruising altitude of 31,000 feet. 
Thirty minutes later, Justice 113 begins its descent into Oklahoma City. As you can see on board the airplane, at 31,000 feet, uh, the prisoners, there's no place for them to go. It's a very uh, secured environment. When we land in Oklahoma City, we'll land and then we'll taxi directly over to the Federal Transfer Center. Uh, they're on the airport in Oklahoma City. But once we land, the jetway will swing out from the institution and we'll open up the doors. And then at that time, we'll exchange the transfer. All these prisoners on this airplane will then walk into the jetway, into the institution, and their feet will never touch the ground. Uh, the most vital, important part of this is at all times they're away from the general public. The Federal Detention Center is a penitentiary located on the grounds of Will Rogers Airport in Oklahoma City. Convicts disembark directly into prison. From here, they will catch another Con Air flight to their final prison destination. While these prisoners were cleared for a standard Con Air prison flight, a special few require security measures that are even more extreme. They are so dangerous, they must be flown in solitary confinement. While Con Air can safely transport over 100 violent convicts at a time, some prisoners pose such an extreme threat that they merit equally extreme security measures. If we move someone as an individual, that means that they are either a, an incredibly high security risk, uh, someone who is uh, a high profile prisoner, you can't afford to have them out in public, so you move them by themselves. Flights transporting one convict in isolation are arranged not only for the protection of the public, but for the protection of the prisoner. Do you think that they and, uh, and Nichols were accused of uh, the bombing incident in the federal building in Oklahoma City? There was considerable transportation of those individuals. Uh, when they were in Oklahoma City, uh, the local U.S. Marshal's office did the transporting, and j -Patch then had to transport those two individuals uh, from a secure location to the trial in Denver, Colorado. Other high-profile prisoners, such as organized crime leaders, present an extreme escape risk. John Gotti, uh, from our understanding, was the head of a uh, organized crime family in New York City. Uh, he was indicted numerous times. The violent nature of that business makes these people particularly dangerous. They have the money to uh, be able to orchestrate escapes if they, if they have the opportunity to do so. The challenge in transporting a prisoner of John Gotti's stature is to prevent the critical information leaks to the media information which would be invaluable to accomplices plotting to assist an escape. The press has their job to do also, and they're constantly trying to find out when we're picking someone up or when we're moving, when we're flying. And, and for, because of security reasons, uh, we don't usually want to publicize that uh, because we want everything to stay safe, and uh, it's better that, uh, that those things stay as quiet as we can until we actually get the defendant to the institution. Unlike John Gotti, the most dangerous of the Con Air solo passengers have no need for accomplices to create havoc. They stand alone as killing machines. There's one prisoner in the system right now that can break handcuffs, basically like you'd break a piece of thread. There's people in the system that have killed up to 20 people. The commissioners of the Aryan nations, very extreme, very violent, they've killed multiple. And it's a feather in their cap if they kill say a female law enforcement officer and the joint is one thing if they do it on the street it's it's bigger points we handle the baddest of the bad is what it comes down to when they have take them out of the cell they take them they take six guards to take them out of the cell to move them anywhere well in the case of uh, moving a prisoner on con air we uh, use full restraints on them uh, there, there's virtually no chance of escape or no chance of, of an assault on, on one of our officers Rendering harmless the most violent of predators requires that the wrists be triple locked. In addition to handcuffs and a black box, the hands are placed in a set of synthetic mittens that prevent him from using his fingers. We've got issues where people have actually pulled things off of an aircraft and used them to make shanks. With that mitten on top of an individual's hands, he's prevented from even touching his fingertips. 
the final security device constrains the convict's movements to an even more extreme degree, one that has inspired Hollywood prop masters. The mask prevents the inmate from spitting, manipulating the restraints with his teeth, or biting his guards. Though these measures may seem like overkill, the marshals are trained to never underestimate the criminal mind. Everybody in the system is clever. That's all they do is practice on uh, martial art holes of uh, pressure points, because that's all they have is time on their hands. Uh, physically, mentally, uh, they're in their own world. And, and at any given time, they can have their upper hand. Once prepped for the move, the transport team acts quickly, with no advance notice to their captive. If he is a high profiler, uh, he can be carried in, a, in an armored car. Uh, and with that armored car, there's chase vehicles. You may take out the first car, but you're not going to take out the convoy of uh, U.S. Marshals and other law enforcement that are fully aware. As the prisoner arrives at the airstrip, the Con Air jet is already prepped and ready for takeoff. And just as they do for standard Con Air flights, marshals form a security perimeter around the aircraft. There are two possibilities. One, that there, there could be an escape of a, of a prisoner being moved. Uh, the other risk is the possibility of someone attempting to aid in an escape. And so uh, you know, that's why you see the armed people securing the perimeter to prevent uh, outside forces from uh, engineering an escape. It is the marshal's sworn duty not only to prevent their prisoner from escaping, but to prevent any attacker from harming the prisoner. You're looking at an area that's 3,000 yards open, a sniper in the event that they want to take that individual out, we couldn't do anything about it. If you want somebody bad enough, you'll get them. We do everything that's possible to make sure that that doesn't happen. Once on board, the final security measure goes instantly into effect. Marshals are forbidden to converse with their isolated passenger. It certainly is a jail environment in the, in the air. There are no frills to the flights. Once seated, they are not allowed to get up for any reason. It is a very controlled environment. Uh, obviously, at, at 30,000 feet, you can't afford to have an incident. Passengers requiring this extreme form of confinement aboard Con Air are invariably transported to a prison where security is just as tight. One such penitentiary is Pelican Bay State Prison in Northern California, home to many of the most sinister convicts alive. The challenging art of transporting convicts is faced not only on a national scale by Con Air, but also on a much smaller level, within the walls of America's penitentiaries. Nowhere is this challenge more daunting, perhaps, than at the Pelican Bay State Prison in California. A 275-acre facility located near the Oregon border, Pelican Bay is designed to isolate nearly 4,000 of the state's most violent inmates. Pelican Bay State Prison is referred to as housing the worst of the worst. In order to transport such volatile convicts between various facilities over the far-flung prison compound, corrections officers here rely on uniquely designed equipment and well-rehearsed procedures. the dozens of inmates each day required to go to Pelican Bay's medical clinics. Guards use a special lockdown bus, a mobile prison inside the walls. Maximum 10 inmates on the bus at one time to take them to the clinic or to return them back. The little cages here to prevent them from spitting or spearing or anything such. 
The bus is checked frequently to make sure no contraband has been stashed and that nothing has been removed which may be fashioned into a weapon. Security is further enhanced by the lack of any centralized bus stop where convicts could gather and come into conflict with each other or with guards. Service is door to door. Lieutenant Ben Grundy has been with Pelican Bay since its inception in 1991. Security is very high at this prison. You, you'll notice when you go in and come out, you have to go through a number of checks, number of what we call sally port, double gates, and numerous doors that are uh, electronically operated. Even when convicts are moved simply on foot, they are subjected to the tightest possible security standards. Everywhere we go, we're being escorted to the medical department on a visit. When we're doing escorts in a tense situation like this, we make sure that it's a hands-on escort. Putting California's worst inmates together in Pelican Bay resulted in the greatest concentration of racially allied prison gangs in the state, a powder keg of racial tension that would eventually reach its breaking point. On February 23rd, we had the major riot. We had a big race war out here on, on B Yard. The riot was one of the worst in state history. As rival gangs began to retaliate against each other, the prison descended into a violent race war. There's a race war pretty much amongst all the inmates. You know, there's, there's no telling when one might go after another. At Pelican Bay, the simple act of walking across the prison yard can get an inmate killed. Even though an inmate is locked up at Pelican Bay State Prison, he is a convicted felon. He has a right to walk in the general population or move around within the prison system without being stabbed. To protect the inmates, prison officials declared a state of emergency. There's a lot of racial incidents here between inmates. And there's been so much, we're on lockdown. When we're locked down, basically what that means is that the inmate movement is greatly restricted. They're not allowed to come out on the general population yard and play basketball or volleyball and just kick it with their homeboys. They are locked down. They spend most of their time in their cell. We don't mix up races. In the first stage of the lockdown, the inmates were only allowed to mix with other inmates of their own race. They'll stab each other because somebody might not have been involved in one of the other race wars. Those who didn't participate in the race war were targeted by their own race. They've been attacking each other, their own racial groups, and the people that they should be getting along with. So we've gone to a total lockdown. Pelican Bay's total lockdown has created a unique situation where even prisoners locked in an institution require full-time security from other prisoners. Every inmate movement is uh, calculated. They're handcuffed to go to the showers. They're handcuffed to go to the doctor. For the inmates' protection, Pelican Bay's notorious killing fields, the yards, are kept vacant. If we let these people out right now, uh, there's, there's no question in my mind or any of anybody else's mind that they would definitely assault each other, uh, possibly with weapons, and possibly even come after one of us. They're scared to let us off. They want no more violence. If we let them go without the handcuffs and the hands-on escorts right now, they'd, would, there'd be blood on the yard all day long. Inmates are searched for weapons each time they move outside their cell block. Some go to extreme measures to move weapons and contraband. We want the inmate to uh, take off his clothes so we can check all his body orifices, you know, look in his mouth, look in his ears. Um, we have them stand there, they bend down so we can see uh, between their legs and they spread their buttocks so that we can make sure that they don't have anything secreted. Another officer will take a handheld metal detector. We'll have the inmate bend over at the waist and he'll wand his backside because they usually try to secrete something. Basically, they're, they're placing weapons in their buttocks and in their rectal cavity. 
Inmates manufacture weapons out of any piece of material they can get their hands on. They're masters at hiding weapons. Some of them probably do have weapons, and we miss that, but that's just the nature of the game. As tightly guarded as these prisoners are on the so-called main line, Pelican Bay boasts a facility that is even more restrictive. The secure housing unit, or the SHU, is essentially a prison within a prison. The purpose of the security housing unit is to remove the inmates that are causing problems or committing felonies uh, from the general population. They have demonstrated that they can't function in that environment without acting out or causing people around them harm or attempting to prey on them. So they're removed from the general population and they're locked up. Here, prisoners are locked in their cells 23 hours a day. Everything they need to serve their sentence is contained here. There is no out of doors. Inside of the security housing unit, or the SHU, inmates are escorted everywhere they go. Everywhere these predatory offenders move within the SHU, they are always under the watchful eye of an armed guard on a catwalk above. Anticipating violent outbursts, the guards protect themselves with armored vests designed to repel knife attacks. Due to the level of these inmates and their violence, there's always a possibility to be stabbed or speared or attacked um, in a security housing unit. All officers are, are mandated to wear the vest. When an inmate is escorted in the shoe, he is never allowed to proceed a correctional officer through a doorway. To prevent contact between inmates, the officer will always make sure the area is clear before proceeding with his prisoner. Prisoners are strip searched every time they leave their cells. A transport to the library within the shoe requires yet another extreme security precaution. They'll be hooked together. With the chain that hooks them together, we can use less staff to move more inmates. We have to give the inmates access to all the legal materials so they can file their cases. They review the books there, turn the books back in, and then they return to their cells. Allowed only 30 minutes inside the library, convicts are strip searched yet again before they are returned. They're allowed to bring back three sheets of paper um, with the information they needed, and that's all they're allowed to bring back. The inmates are moved by, by uh, unit so that they can't pass information on from unit to unit to unit. It's, it's just our attempt to try to keep down the, the uh, gang information flow. Uh, we do it as good as we can. We know it still gets around. Even prisoners in the SHU are sometimes required to be moved outside Pelican Bay's secure walls for court appearances or medical appointments. As level four inmates, the highest security risks they are then subjected to an even greater security measure. Even within the institution, they have to be escorted. But when they leave the institution, it's a whole another matter. The vehicle that they're in, in effect, becomes a prison on wheels. And we do not have the luxury of the fence as a perimeter, uh, nor do we have the prison walls. It's not business as usual. It's very serious, and they're still dealing with a level four convicted felon that they need to get back inside of the walls. Pelican Bay is probably one of the most secure prisons in the state of California. Really the only time anybody would have a chance of uh, breaking somebody out is when we're out on one of these transports. The prison convoy is inspected exhaustively inside the sally port, a double-gated checkpoint where everything going in or out of the prison must first be authorized. Here, officers are issued weapons for their venture outside the walls. Anytime you take out a level four, it's uh, one sergeant, three officers, and everybody's armed. We don't give them any prior notice. That way, uh, there's less chance of them being able to uh, notify anybody on the outside that they're out. Less chance of a, a, an escape attempt. On this day, the transportation team is moving inmates to a local hospital for appointments with heart specialists. To minimize the chance of an ambush by a convict's accomplices lying in wait along the road, 
officers vary their route daily, avoiding predictability. Anything can go wrong when you're outside of the walls. You have to uh, be careful about what could be a staged event. You could uh, have a, a cuff key inside of a body cavity and try to take off his restraints. Throughout their venture outside the walls, inmates are never out of a correctional officer's sight. The unarmed officer actually has hands on the inmate. The uh, armed officer just follows at a safe distance to provide uh, gun coverage in case the inmate tries something. The Pelican Bay transportation officers have mastered the art of moving society's most dangerous criminals, just like their counterparts aboard Con Air. Whether it's transporting a prisoner across the yard or across the country, Law enforcement is using extreme security procedures to make sure the general public is kept safe. We take every precaution to make sure that the public is not confronted by those types of individuals. We've been in the business of moving prisoners for a long time, and there's probably not a lot of things that we haven't seen. I feel very confident that uh, the public is not at risk when these inmates are being transported from prison to prison. We've moved hundreds of thousands of prisoners without an escape. From vans to buses to the specialized fleet of jets, the mission is the same. Taking prison safely on the move. We do the same thing that any jail, any prison, federal, state, county, we just do it 35,000 feet in the air and a lot faster. This high-flying powder keg is the Justice Prisoner Alien Transportation System, or JPATS. But to guards and prisoners alike, it is known simply as Con Air. Entrusted with the formidable task of transporting America's convicted felons are the United States Marshals. The nerve center of their operation is the JPATS Command Center outside of Kansas City, Missouri. Here, the travel itineraries of prisoners all across the nation are meticulously scheduled, then closely monitored as the convicts are in transit. Supervising the command center's activities is U.S. Marshal Kent Pekarik. Uh, sometimes we're referred to as a travel agency. Uh, somebody calls a travel agency and says, I want to go from Miami to uh, Atlanta. That's pretty simple. But the people that we're moving aren't making the phone calls. It could be a United States District Judge, it could be a U.S. Magistrate, it could be a defense attorney. And they're calling us and saying, we want uh, John Doe in Miami uh, at this place in Los Angeles by 2 o'clock next Thursday. Although transferring convicts is potentially perilous, it's a necessity. Some must be transferred to maximum security prisons because of a long record of attempted escapes. Others are international felons facing extradition who must be relocated to foreign nations. But the majority of convicts in transit are those legally entitled or obligated to make appearances in America's courts. Transporting the most menacing criminals on the same highways and flight paths as the citizens they have endangered 
is the price of a free society. On any given day, the Marshal Service has approximately 35,000 prisoners in its custody, and these people are in one stage or another of the federal judicial process. They're either on trial, testifying in a trial, or awaiting uh, transportation to a Bureau of Prisons facility to serve their sentence. Before JPATS, or Con Air, was formed, all of these prisoners were moved across the country exclusively on the ground. Now they can be transported by a fleet of three 727s, two DC-9s, and eight corporate-sized jets. The swifter system ensures greater security. It's far better to fly a prisoner across the country in four hours or five hours than to take several days to drive them. The longer they're out of the secure environment, the greater the risk. Even on a flight of short duration, however, the risks can only be minimized, never eliminated. Although the U.S. Marshals rigidly enforce the most extreme security measures, the convicts in their custody are a volatile mix of desperation and resourcefulness. They board Con Air from Leavenworth, from San Quentin, and from Attica. Men convicted of murder, rape, and acts of terrorism. They range from low-level gangsters and petty thieves to high-profile convicts such as New York mobster John Gotti and Oklahoma City bombers Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols. But no matter what their criminal background, they have one thing in common. Outside the secure walls of a federal penitentiary, even surrounded by vigilant armed guards, they may be tempted by even the remotest possibility of escape. Most of the prisoners uh, in our custody are, are uh, felons, and they uh, have generally uh, been determined to be a flight risk. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in our custody. They'd be out on bail. Any time you move a prisoner outside of a secure environment, like a jail or a prison, you increase the opportunity for escape. The chances of escape grow even higher when a convict in transit is able to receive help from an outside accomplice. In order to prevent this scenario, they are confined in a vortex of tension where fear and anger rule. Their greatest enemy is one another. Survival often depends on savagery. America's prisons have produced a new breed of predators. If we let them go without the handcuffs, there'd be blood on the yard all day long. They are attacking each other on sight. Locked cells and thick walls keep them safely isolated from the public. However, each day, many are not behind bars. They're on the nation's roadways and flight paths. Basically, that is a prison. We're moving down the road. These planes are a high max cell block in the sky. We do the same thing that any jail. We just do it 35,000 feet in the air and a lot faster. The officers who transport America's convicts are on constant alert. They know a crisis can erupt at any moment, ignited by dangerous and desperate men lusting for escape. Anything can go wrong when you're outside of the walls. When you think you've seen it all, you haven't seen anything yet. The marshals devising a prisoner's travel plans operate in conditions of absolute secrecy. We don't tell the prisoners, number one, when they're going to be moved. So if you don't tell them, they can't tell anybody ahead of time. No one outside of JPATS knows the specific route any convict will take to get from point A to point B. Another routine security precaution taken during the planning phase is an exhaustive background check of each traveling prisoner. Because of security issues and medical issues, safety issues, we want to know what type of individual we're moving. In fact, we probably know more about that particular individual than he knows about himself. Armed with detailed biographical information, 
JPAT's travel coordinators are able to make sure that rival gangs and sworn enemies never share the same Con Air flight. Every effort is made to snuff out any problem long before it has a chance to spark a crisis at 35,000 feet. While America sleeps, the transportation operation begins. The Con Air network utilizes not only planes, but a specialized fleet of cars, vans, and buses. Good morning. How are you doing? The pre-dawn start time is designed to minimize risk to the nation's motorists by taking to the roads when traffic is lightest. Here at the Chino State Prison in Southern California, prisoners.